What's going on everybody? I just wanted to make this video on an insight that I just had during a meditation. It was one of those good ones. Um, if you practice meditation, you'll realize that not all of them are awesome. Some of them suck because your mind just keeps going nuts. Uh, but this was one of those good ones where you get a wave of energy. Some people out there probably uh, insight. It's super intense. It was a very intense one. I'm not going to go into that description, but it was awesome. I'm sure some people um, have meditations that are just epic all the time, uh, but not my experience. So anyway, I had a really deepening insight. In Zen, they'll talk about uh, these spiritual or timeless or ancient lessons like uh, non-attachment or non-judgment or things like that, where you learn them, but the, the depth in which you know them is infinite. And the insight that I received was the deepening of understanding that fear is the virus. And, you know, this is obvious to some people consciously, but I want to kind of go a little bit deeper into that understanding. And so I came across this quote or this piece of information that I really like. I can't verify the source of the book, but it says, uh, um, here, I'll even share the screen. Let me see if I can do this. Here we go. Fear was not allowed in ancient tribes, and anyone was considered a plague and was considered a plague for the soul. Anyone who carried it within and couldn't free themselves of it was banished in order to prevent it from infecting the rest of the village, making them sick as well. And if you look at our world, that's what's happening. Um, you know, people who are not afraid of the coronavirus are, are being attacked, or if you're not afraid of other things, they're kind of being attacked. And so we're seeing it out in the world that we live. Uh, fear is a sickness. It will crawl into the soul of anyone who engages it. It has tainted your peace already. I did not raise to see you live in fear. Strike it from your heart. Do not bring it into our village. So this is a really powerful insight if you really contemplate on it. And uh, my buddy, Mark England, I like him. I love him. He's awesome. And he just talks about levels of thinking. He's like, thinking is useless. You know, thinking doesn't get anything done. But when you get into contemplation, that's where something can happen. And so contemplate on that. Fear is a sickness. And I've been using the example, trying to do the research on both sides and really going through my own, again, like you call it deep contemplation, sadness, uh, compassion, like when something serious is happening on the planet, I, and I can see that. Um, so a lot of people are waking up. So many people are waking up. You see people talking more about human trafficking. Um, it's interesting because the people that really prefer to just go along with the narrative of what's going on, they're wearing masks in their car. They're afraid of uh, you know, something that has a very little uh, death rate. They're probably going to die of something else. They might die of the coronavirus. Um, it's possible, but it's definitely not the most deadly thing on the planet, but they're living in more fear, more fear. And if you study and look into self-healing, the power of the body, germ theory versus terrain theory, you talk to anybody who've, who's cured themselves of a terminal illness, cancer, uh, really intense thing, which I have. I've interviewed them on the podcast. I've spoken to them in person at events like Dr. Joe Dispenza's, um, reading books on self-healing. You know that if they're in a fear, anxiety, depressed mindset, that they're toast. You know, Whatever that thing is, is going to get them. But if you are diagnosed with something that could be a terminal illness, your mindset is number one. That is the thing that you absolutely have to change. It gives you the best opportunity. It doesn't, it's not like, oh, I'm going to just visualize health and then I'm healed. It doesn't work like that. It increases the probability immensely. And so when I'm teaching a kid how to do a backflip or uh, an extreme sports athlete or something like that, or we're working on somebody's business and, I, and we elicit what that idea is. So sports is the easiest example. Throw a strike in baseball, land the backflip, um, whatever you're going to do. If you can visualize it and believe it 100%, then you increase that probability tenfold, a hundredfold. You're applying your will, your energy, your soul, your connection with the universe, your power to that outcome. When you are in fear, you are giving that outcome to something outside of your control. So same thing with something intense like cancer, same thing with uh, coronavirus, same thing with anything that might take you down because death is guaranteed. It's something that we're going to experience here. But if you don't want to go and you, you get that disease that they say is terminal, you have to improve the quality of your mindset and direct your will towards healing. 
towards what you want to removing the fear and focusing on what you want. Just like um, going to do the backflip. It's the exact same thing. If, if my athletes going down and they're ready to do the backflip and as they approach the jump the whole entire time, they're afraid of landing on their head. They're focusing about landing on their head. They're imagining all the different ways that they could land on their head. They're going to land on their head. They're not exercising their will. It's something outside of them. And it's the same thing with fear and the coronavirus and anything else that cancer. If you have that, if you're just focusing on all the ways that it could take you down, then it's going to increase the probability of that's what's going to happen. Just like the backflip. Now to improve your chances dramatically, because we influence a reality. We have to, there's also the surrender to the bigger piece. Nobody here has any idea what is going on. Everybody knows a tiny little bit of a tiny little bit. And I know that for sure because I've interviewed some of the smartest people on the entire planet and they only know a little bit of a little bit. And the smartest people always say the same thing. They're like, I only know a little bit, you know? It's like, there's so much to know. It's so infinite and vast. But what we do know is our intention. We know our will. We know where we can direct our energy. And this is the major issue of what's going on now because I've been it during this pandemic stuck in fear at times. Um, I've seen people that I love wake up and they're afraid because they learned about human trafficking. They learned about pedophilia. They learned about Hollywood. They learned about systems of control. So many other people on the other side, like, oh, I'm afraid of the virus. I'm going to wear a mask. And you can, you know, you can do that. Um, but the other side is way more frightening, I assure you. And it's way more real. And you can verify with evidence uh, past from years ago to to present, to what they're saying now, and to the plan of what they have written down. And then you look at the money trails, it's obvious stuff. It just is what it is. And so, um, so they're afraid. And then I got afraid because I have such an intake of information of people just sharing all this stuff. And I'm like, holy smokes, microchips, the whole thing. It's all, it's all there. It's all legit. It's super terrifying. And then and this meditation and, you know, what was helpful too was uh, doing the podcast with Dr. Nisha Manik. And uh, she talked about her awakening experience um, looking at the Buddha relics. And actually, that's what I was doing. I was looking at the relics of the Buddha. She sent me the photos of those. And I was listening to going back to these Tibetan mantras that I was listening to um, and filling my mind with positive mental nutrients. It's like, you know what you're supposed to do and you know what's helpful, but you don't do it. Like, you know, you should eat a vegetable, but you keep eating KFC every day because it's so delicious and it gets addicting. I don't really like KFC, but I like that as an example because it's probably the worst for you. Um, and as a side note, I love that South Park. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it where um, they get a bucket of KFC chicken and uh, Cartman, um, everybody leaves the room and Cartman goes in and he eats all the skin off of every single piece and then leaves and then Kenny starts crying. That's, uh, I thought that was hilarious. Um, anyway, so the heck was I? I got distracted by South Park. I'll figure it out. But so when you awaken to this new reality, it's terrifying. But talking to Dr. Nisha Manik and just focusing on what we want to build, um, I remember, and this is experienced several times, and then a little brief reminder today with the meditation and whatever happened, that uh, we are so infinitely expansive, something that I know but didn't feel because I was feel, feeling afraid, feeling afraid of all the stuff that was going on. I look at Australia, um, super intense what's going on over there. The, the plan, again, is super terrifying and some people are very aware of it. And in this space, what the truth is, is that we are incredibly powerful, that we influence our reality immensely. And how humans are controlled is through fear. Again, it's a common sense thing, um, but it's all based on lies, delusion. Um, that's what the veil is. It's this veil of fear. It limits your pattern recognition. It sends different hormones and uh, chemicals throughout the body. So you are not at your full capacity. And I know this from uh, martial arts. You can see when people give up uh, mentally. Uh, my, my dad was actually telling me a story about how he got in this fight when he was younger. And the guy said something like, that's not going to help you. And he goes, it took the fight out of me. And that's when you know you're toast. And that's what I see happening out here. It's taking the fight out of people. Some people um, are kind of fighting back, but, you know, protesting is okay. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with any expression, um, but directing that will and energy toward a solution, right? To, to get that solution um, as precise as possible to build the solution to really move and intend what we want to do 
in, in the best way. And so if protesting is the best solution we have at the time, great. If it's writing your letter to your local representative, if government does anything at all and it's not just controlled by corporate greedy interests, I don't know. Um, a lot of them are. And I don't know. But directing those solutions. And again, when you, when you have this experience or insight, you know that you're eternal and that you are incredibly powerful and you are influencing a field. You are influencing the whole field around you um, as you do everything. And so you probably met some of those people in your life where actually it's easier when they're so negative. It's like you stay as far away as you can because you're like, oh, I don't want that to infect me. Like they're so negative. I can't keep them. I can't get them anywhere near me. And that's like the energy. That's a field they're producing. And on the flip side, you might meet some people that are like, I can't wait to go talk to them. They're so warm. They're so powerful. They're so loving. I just love their energy. That's the field they generate. And so what's happening out in the world, you look at the media, it's all artificial screens. You're looking at me through an artificial screen. You look at your phone, it's an artificial screen. And um, I remember David Lone Bear Senepass, uh talking about how they had a prophecy of the rainbow monster stealing the minds of your children. And that is essentially the television. It's the screen. It's this artificial world. And when we're looking at the artificial world right now, um, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. If you haven't heard about the coronavirus, um, you, would be, you wouldn't be afraid right? You would, you'd be like, you, you, you could go travel. I've traveled a lot of countries. You might get something, you might get sick, but the chances of you getting better are very good. The chances of you uh, dying of this particular thing is not very high. You could, but you could die of many other particular things. But when it's focused, right? You direct the energy. Like if they did it in traffic accidents and they focus like, what they're doing with coronavirus on traffic accidents, you'd be scared crapless. You'd be like, oh my God. It's like, this guy broke his leg today. That guy broke his leg today. You know, these people died. It, like that happens all the time. But that's where you're putting your attention, energy, and focus. And that's also where the surrender happens. You're, you're going to die. You know, I'm going to die. You're going to die. Um, but we're also eternal beings. And what we need to remember is that fear is definitely a virus. It is going to increase the probability that you can be controlled. And if you want to be free and you want to be in alignment with spirit, uh, God, nature, the universe, however you want to call it, you need to be courageous. Um, and I've studied a lot about fear and helped it. You know, extreme sports is all about handling fear because everything, every time you progress a little bit further, you're putting yourself on the line. And even when you're doing stuff within your realm of capability on a snowboard or a skateboard or extreme sports or whatever you're doing, you're, there's still a level of danger. You got to be on point. And so what I believe to be mostly true is that you're going to be afraid, but you build your courage and you do that through training. You do that through proper preparation. Uh, you do that through incremental improvements and you do that through connection. And so when you connect to yourself and your power and your capabilities and you train, you're going to be like, you're going to like, yeah, I'm strong. So right now, again, let's talk about coronavirus. You know, you're afraid of the coronavirus. Well, eat good food. Um, De-stress your life, right? Because that increases the probability of getting uh, sick and uh, exercise. Right. And so the people that I know that are really healthy have no concern at all because they live a positive, empowered, healthy lifestyle. And on a global scale, we just see this fear going on. And so that's how this system gets rolled out. There is a system, there's a plan. It's event. Uh, well, event 201 was the simulation, but um, agenda 2030 by the UN. You can look that up. That will tell you exactly what they want to do. Uh, they've already said they want to vaccinate the entire world. Uh, they'd like to have a more top-down government uh, contact tracing, right? When's the last? When's the last time on Earth? You know, it's so people. It's you know, it's so nuts. They got COVID, COVID idiots trending on one side, right? And then they got COVID idiots trending on another side. So they'll say COVID idiots are are now um, you know protesting in Germany. Well, they didn't say that when it was Black Lives Matter. So what's the difference? You know, there's one side is definitely not thinking as critically as the other side for sure. And, but they're both saying the same thing. Um, so it's, I see a, I see this craziness. Um, and so they'll use uh, um, Germany. I've, I've had people use that 
scenario on me and I use it to them because I studied that property. I actually studied it. And I, because I was so curious how good people did bad things and look at the Milgram experiment that talks about it. Um, look at the Stanford prison experiment that talks about it. Look at Darren Brown and his uh, group think experiment that talks about it. Look at the century of self. Some people have written me after watching that and being like, Oh my goodness. And that's the one you got to watch that if you want to know what's going on. Um, and so it's crazy that the other side will say, Oh, you know, you're being manipulated. And maybe I am actually, I'll, I'll just give you that. Who knows? Maybe I am. I don't know, but I'll look at how, you know, actually, this is how, you know, if you're being manipulated, you look at both sides. So when they say, Oh, you're being manipulated, like why? And like, look right at it, go right into it and then weigh the evidence on both sides. And so when I do that over and over and over and over again, one side just has way more logical, critical evidence. And if the, if your opposing view, all of a sudden they come up with a haymaker, you know, it's like you're fighting uh, Mike Tyson, right? And I don't know, this is a weird example. Let's say you're fighting Mike Tyson and you're just beating the crap out of him the whole time. You're like Muhammad Ali. He can't touch you. You're Muhammad Ali, right? Boom, boom, boom. You say Muhammad Ali is going to beat Tyson and Ali's just boom, dipping and weaving, doing what he does. Just jabbing him, just kicking the butt, kicking Mike Tyson's butt. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, round 12 or back in the day, they had 15 rounds. I don't know how many people know that, but they had 15 rounds back in the day. Like this is a most, and sometimes they said that they'd lose up to 10 or 15 pounds. I, I can, don't exactly what, know what the number was, but they would lose a lot of weight because they have this intense battle. So anyway, back to the analogy. Muhammad Ali, you, you're on the side of Muhammad Ali, crush Mike Tyson all day, right? And so he is all the way up to round 12. And then all of a sudden, Mike Tyson just does his thing and just smacks him right in the mouth. Just buff Mike Tyson haymaker, right? Well, you got to eat that. And, and if, if it's true, like if it's true, if the haymaker of the other side of what you believe, and I love using the Trump analogy right now, if you believe Trump is the best and you get evidence that he is the worst, you look at it. If you think he is the worst and you get evidence that he is the best, you look at it. Um, so maybe you're going to get haymaker on either side, but you're only going to know if it's true if you take the punch, if you look at it. And so if I get Mike Tyson on the other side of what I believe, and it's like, whoa, this is totally polar opposite to what I believe, um, I'll look at it. And one of those examples for me going through this was Florida. Um, I was like, oh, crap. I was like, you know, I knew about the testing. I knew about the false positives. I know how the test works. I know it's not the most reliable. I know there's a bunch of false positives from doing research. And then someone says, oh, you know, Florida is, you know, really bad right now, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, maybe, maybe we're in it now. Oh, smokes. So I just kind of keep, keep my ear to the ground. Then I learn that they're labeling them all false positives. So it's just another thing. And I was skeptical because there's been so many lies and misinformation the whole time. So I'm just looking at the trend and all the other information that's over here, but willing to get, you know, that's a Mike Tyson one. So what if there is this many cases, but then the next thing I would have looked at is how many are critical, how many are dying. Um, that's another thing because depending on the numbers, what are the numbers that we use to say, we're going to lock down these, uh, create these uh, tyrannical measures. And back to the Germany example and studying Germany, some people are saying, well, if you want, you know, freedom and not to wear a mask or whatever, you're basically co-opted. And I've had this said to me and I looked at it and then I asked for the reasoning and stuff. And it was, they presented an argument, but it, you know, it wasn't that strong. It wasn't a Mike Tyson punch. It was more like, you know, it wasn't a strong punch. And so I looked at it though. I'd look right at it. But if you look at that analogy, they had a group of people and then they said, start telling on people. And so contact tracing start spying on your neighbors, start doing all this stuff. Does that feel like freedom, life affirming, empowering? Um, it doesn't to me. It seems like obvious tyranny. It seems like fear. And again, when you're making legislation, when you're mandating things based on fear, it is most likely coming from tyranny. And then that's why so many people are doing this research to say, hey, you know, we don't need to be as, as afraid as, as what they're saying. And so if we're less afraid, we can have more freedom to move around. So if we did the car accidents uh, example and how many people, Matt, you know how many people die and, and get injured in scooter accidents in like uh, India and, and those places, like tons and tons and tons. The traffic is insane. I remember when I was in Nepal meditating with the monks 
um, I was on a scooter and we were going through one of the major intersections and there was no lights. They don't even have lights. It's like there was thousands of people on scooters. And then all of a sudden, after a certain period of time, they just decide when that is, they start, they just start literally cutting off the other side of traffic with big trucks and all this other stuff. It's insane. It is the most insane thing ever. And so if they were to start focusing on the news, like, you know, traffic accidents are up. We had more accidents today. You know, we need to do this with the roads, that with the roads. They start enforcing and then everyone would be walking, right? And then you could do that with, oh, you need to be walking. And then um, you need to do this and you need to do that. And so they're enforcing it through fear, but we, ha we are taking a risk. When we were born, we're at risk, you know? Back in the day, we would get uh, chopped by saber-toothed tigers or uh, whatever might have you out there, you know? It's terrifying. And so we gotta remember that the truth is we are incredibly expansive, connective, eternal, powerful beings and creators, and we're influencing our world. And if we're stuck in fear, and we're afraid of our neighbors and we're afraid of the government and we're afraid of the cabal and we're afraid of all those things. Um, it's going to limit our choices and our pattern recognition to go build a solution. We are more powerful than any of that. Um, and I feel like I just forgot, you know, it's like I knew it mentally and I'm still hopeful. Like I don't know for sure. Um, but like in my guts and that's what that little meditation I had there kind of reminded me. It's like, no, 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 man, you're eternal. You're connected to everything. Uh, you know, you're infinitely powerful. You might have to deal with some stuff, uh, but you're infinitely powerful. And I was thinking about, as I've been using the example of the samurai warrior, the greatest samurai warrior or ancient warrior that would go to battle, they would know there's a battle coming. They would know it. And that would be terrifying saying these, this army's coming. You'd think, oh crap, the army is coming. That is some terrifying stuff. But with their skill, with their knowledge, with their preparation, with their training and with their calmness, they don't move into fear. The second you move into fear in an MMA fight or uh, extreme sports or with your business, if you're constantly in stress, you're probably not uh, meeting the business goals you want because you're not in a high performance state. So even in a, the best MMA athletes, when they're getting their butts handed to them, they're still looking for that one second. They could be losing five out of five rounds like Anderson Silva, actually. This is a great example. A Anderson Silva versus Chael Sonnen. Uh, he got his butt kicked the whole time and Anderson Silva was untouchable. And with like 30 seconds in the fifth round, you know, Anderson Silva throws up a triangle choke and gets him. He never gave up. You know, he was, uh, even though he's getting his butt kicked, he's looking for, he's calm. He's looking for that opportunity. The second you get into fear and, de and then the defeat, you're acquiescing. And that's what the agenda really is. I think they're trying to get us to acquiesce through fear. You know, oh, now we're going to vaccinate you and put the chip in it. Now we're going to tell our neighbors. Now we need all these other things because you're afraid. And we need people to be courageous. We need people to have clear minds, clear hearts, um, to question things, to, apply the golden rule uh, to test their knowledge through a debate. Um, you know, just attacking someone else and call them an idiot is not a debate. You don't know if you know what you know. Um, you know, if you look at the Robert Kennedy Jr. debate versus uh, Alan Dershowitz, I think his name is, he destroyed him, absolutely annihilated him. And so if you're like an anti-vaxxer or whatever, look at that. Look at that debate. You'll know what the truth is because one guy was on truth, was on research and, and logic and science and all of them. And one thing was true. And the bummer here is that, you know, as a martial artist, you, you know, and or a boxer or something, you can go test your skills. So someone's like, oh, yeah, I beat you up. And you say, oh, I guess this is a pretty masculine and, and personal example for me. Uh, but, you know, when you're a kid growing up, it's like, oh, I could take you or I'm better than you. You compete to see who's better, just like a race. You can do a foot race. I'm faster than you. No, I'm faster than you. So you race. And uh, then you know who, who's who got the skills. And you can then get better and you can learn from each other. And iron sharpens iron. You can make it a wonderful thing. And the challenge now is that we have all this mental debate, um, but what people are doing rather than competing, they're just using ad hominem logical fallacies. They're not debating. They're just cheating and sewering the race and not showing up and doing all these stupid things so they can maintain superiority. It's like, you know, I say I could beat you up and you say you could beat me up, um, but then you like you rig it or you don't show up or you, you cheat in some way. And that's what's going on because we can't have this one-on-one -on -one debate because I've tried with many people and it is not working. And the couple that did, um, you know, there was just the evidence and research that I shared with them. They didn't have a good rebuttal for, they didn't have a re they didn't have evidence to show me that, uh, 
that would make me want to change my mind. So going back to March, I, I found the best evidence I could on how deadly it was. And it, kept, it said 0 0.26. Guess what happened months and months later? They're like, oh, no, it's the deadliest thing ever. I was like, I haven't seen evidence for that. Show me the evidence. And what I got was modeling. And then when you look into the modeling, uh, Gates funds the Imperial College, right, and funded everything else. He basically funded every organization uh, that's involved with handling this pandemic. And so you just, you just register that as one thing. And then when you register with a whole bunch of other things, you're like, well, that's definitely something to be considered. And then you see the Imperial uh, College's model is complete garbage. And that when it was peer reviewed, they, they basically were saying, how did this garbage pass? How did they use this to lock down the whole world? And so, you know, just doing research and you check it out and you see what's up and stay open-minded. So what else was I going to talk about? Okay. So fear is ignorance it's delusion it's darkness and people are afraid of darkness that's the thing that you know when, when you're afraid um it's like it's like uh it's sunny outside but you got like blindfold on and i guess a mask is a good bloody analogy right now um so you you don't see as clearly you're under this delusion and the fear keeps it that way and so we need to have the courage to test our own beliefs our own uh knowledge um, to be humble, to be wrong, to be open to being wrong, to communicating using the golden rule, and really trying to get to figure out what's going on and then build solutions. So for this is a message to those who have, um, let's say, quote unquote, awakened. And so what might that mean? Um, one person that I'm working with, uh, they said, it's like I grew a heart. Um, that's a little bit of a different one, because they, you know, they're going through their life. And most people go by default. And they just they don't, they don't consciously try to create. It's like, what opportunities do I have? What can I get? You know, I have to do this. I have to do that. Where on the other side is like, you know, who am I? What do I want to do? How can I contribute value to the world? Um, and how can I figure that out? It's a much different mindset. But another one of these um, awakening processes, what's going on right now, is awakening to a whole new worldview, uh, opening to more information. And some of that information is... Uh, the media is lying to you. That's one piece of awakening. People are awake. They know that. They know they can't trust the media. They know they need to find independent resources. Um, they know they need to do their own research. They know that government systems and corporate systems and uh, financial systems, um, they need to be just observed and just understood so that we can find solutions around them. And so when you see this agenda, um, coming forth and it's scary because you don't want that to happen when you when you kind of wake up you don't want to be stuck in fear you want to say okay great like that's what's happening now what am I going to do to empower myself to to be a force in the field to just be in peace in power in connection with something even greater than you know and again it's an external agenda um, and so we, we really want to have clarity on that and I think of the example of like, let's say everybody, we will, um, every, everybody's living in a cave, right? We're all living in this underground cave, right? For years. And then all of a sudden, a few of us go outside and we're out exploring. We're out of this cave now. And then a few of us get eaten by saber tooth tigers. Like, oh my God, that's some scary stuff. So when you wake up, you start looking at some stuff and you're like, holy smokes, that's scary. we got saber-toothed tigers. we got dinosaurs. we got th these things flying out of the sky. Um, some crazy stuff out here. Um, but at the same time, you've got amazing birds. You've got trees. You've got water. You've got all this amazing stuff. So being awake, quote unquote, uh, is kind of like dangerous. You see like, whoa, there's some dangerous stuff out there. Like why do 9.1 million people die of starvation every year? Maybe there's a system for that. Maybe you can figure it out if you do research. Um, and so then the thing is, okay, if that exists, how could I empower myself, my life, my community, align myself with my spirit to make choices and vote for uh, uh, liberty and peace for all through my vocation? What's this little bit uh, that I can do? Because we're not going to be able to solve the bigger picture, unfortunately, but we can collectively, and we do it through individual choices. We do it through individual empowerment. We do it through um, your own connection and recognizing how infinite, expansive, wonderful, creative, empowering you are, and 
when you're like that, you're sending out that signal to every single person you see. But if everybody's in fear and delusion and ignorance and shaming and guilt and the lowest possible uh, like vibration you could be, then we're not helping anyone. And so just you doing that is incredibly powerful. And the more of us that do that, that can get to that space, we're going to be able to shift this. We're going to be able to provide an opportunity. We're going to know the other person who, although it was dangerous, although you and I both went outside, let's say I go outside by myself and there's like two or three of us that, you know, want to go outside the cave and then saber tooth tiger comes. And uh, if it's just one of us, we're probably going to get eaten. two of us. Maybe the saber tooth tiger's like, huh, I'm going to think about this. Like, no, no, I can eat two of you. You definitely can eat two of you. Um, but then a hundred of us go outside saber tooth tiger comes and there's a hundred of us and we're like nah no way buddy there's a hundred of us we don't know what you are right now uh you're super terrifying but we're going to unite and we'll then somebody picks up a stick somebody throws a rock at them uh you know so you do something together and we're more empowered together and that's how this works we need to go outside the cave together we need to stand in the truth although that it could be frightening some parts of it to transmute it to to Build something better to go beyond this system. And you have to do it by getting out of fear first and into the expansive creator infinite part of you. Because if you're in the fear, if we're in it as a community, if we're in it as a society, whether it is the, you know, the government, the cabal, the coronavirus, you know, the coronavirus compared to the cabal and all that stuff is like the least scary thing. So like people, if they're afraid of that, I can't even imagine like what it would be like to wake up to all the other stuff. Like, Oh my God, you know, I was worried about that. This is way worse. And so even then though, even then with that, that thing, we're, we're more powerful. And so I think that's where I kind of got the reminder today with this meditation is like, you know, even if you're the samurai warrior and you're going to war, you are infinite, you are eternal, you are powerful. And the more you can stay in that space of courage, you're going to continue to exist. So maybe that samurai warrior, rather than being in one battle, he's in like 50 battles and then he retires and he doesn't die. But if you go into your first samurai battle and you're scared out of your wits, um, then somebody comes, they chop off your head and poof, you're, you're toast. Um, you know, that could happen. And the samurai warrior who continues the battle and lives, he just was more chill. He just had more courage. He learned how to stay empowered with his center, with creator, with spirit, with force, with determination, with will, and also surrender to the outcome of the possibility of dying because it could absolutely happen. And so we're dealing with that idea on a way smaller scale <laughs> we're just a much softer group of people than we used to be and the main system of control is is certainly fear and um we can figure out ways to overcome that and when we do it together we can build solutions together and just transmute that it just stops it's all based on illusion um a house of cards that could fall at any second. It's all based on lies and illusion and freedom and sovereignty and uh, connection and peace and community and goodness and life affirming actions and virtues. They're just true and they just are. And we can choose those no matter what we're seeing out there. And those are way more powerful than the delusion and the illusion of fear. And if enough of us can wake up to that, and make those choices, um, we can all make them together. And when the oppression happens, it's when there's enough people in fear, in illusion, in delusion to oppress people through some sort of idea of fear. That's how that works. And so we just need an, enough people to be courageous. So I believe I shared everything that I wanted to, but that was the main insight that I wanted to share. You know, we got to step outside this cave together. Yeah, there's some scary stuff out there for sure. Um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't live. And it doesn't mean that we need to be fearful of it all the time. It means that we are going to expand our capabilities. We are going to expand our knowledge. We only knew the cave before, right? Now we're exploring the whole uh, outer world, the whole new world, and it takes courage and it's better to do together. And let's do it together. 
Let's do it together. So that's it. That's my rant. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that it was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know some tactics because I always like tactics. Uh, simple meditation is a very powerful tactic. Journaling is a powerful tactic. If you don't know how to meditate, just set a timer for five minutes, put on some relaxing music, just watch your thoughts. I don't care how you do it. It's not complicated. It's like running. How do you run? Just go run, meditate, just observe your thoughts. But if you do it five minutes a day for, uh, you know, 20 days, 30 days, you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. You're not going to get it until you do it. So uh, meditation is a really great one. Journaling is a great one. Doing some research, um, applying the golden rule, apply the formula for truth, which means if they're giving you information, then just allow it to come in, test, test your knowledge. Um, but if you're using ad hominem, um, uh, attacks like attacking you you don't need to listen to that that's not helpful useful information that's just them coming out of fear and coming out of ego uh, which is rampant everywhere but um and that's one of the other ways i know one side just has a lot more evidence because one side really uses a lot of fear and a lot of guilt and a lot of shaming and a lot of uh all that tactic and the other side is a lot of information a lot of sharing of information a better quality character of people uh, because they're they're just they're they're just demonstrating better character and and so we want to move towards information and towards truth and towards cooperation and we know what that feels like and so there we have it um wishing you all the best a big hug we'll get through this together and and we can build something amazing it just takes a few of us you know 10 people together uh five people together uh, I, lo I love that quote it says like never underestimate what a small group of uh concerned citizens can do um because you know, what margaret mead um and so it's one of my favorite quotes margaret mead i'll get it right i know some of you know what it is never quote let's see never underestimate ah there we go it's coming up very slowly here we go never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world indeed it's the only thing that ever has big love let's do it peace